Good morning. I'm Terry Stevens, and I want to welcome you to Sardis Baptist Church Sunday School Study. Today we'll be looking in Philippians chapter 3. So if you want to get your Bibles, please do so. Philippians chapter 3, and uh, we'll go through most of those verses here in a little bit. Let me again just say we're thankful that you're tuned in to us and watching and listening. And uh, please be mindful of, of, of all the things that are going on around you and around our country and around our world. We want to pray, and we pray each week for our church uh, pastor and the staff that is here. We're thankful for them and the things they do. And we want to thank each one of you for listening. And those of you that cannot come, please continue to be faithful and listening in to Sunday school and especially the worship time. Let's pray. There's many things to remember, many of our own church family. And we just want to pray, start off. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you to thank you for so many blessings. Lord, we love you, and we're thankful that you loved us enough that you would come and you would die on the cross, a sacrificial death for our sins, that we might come to know you in the trueness of life. Father, we thank you for that forgiveness. We thank you for that mercy that you extended and the grace that you showed us. Lord, we just pray that your will be done in our lives each and every day. Help us to stand for you. Help us to live for you. Lord, I pray for our neighbors, our friends, our families, our church family, Lord. Help us all to remember that there's many that are sick, many that are recovering from surgery, many that are grieving for a lost loved one that's passed. Father, you know every need among us. You know us better than we even know ourselves. And Lord, we lift those things to you to just say, please, Lord, Help us through each and every day. Give us the things we need. Give us the strength we need and the courage we need to stand and live and honor you. All these things, Lord, we ask in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. It is, uh, we're celebrating uh, at this time of year a change of seasons. Fall has officially arrived. and uh, In fact, I think this is my first time to put on a long sleeve shirt in many, many, many months. But, uh, you know, when it's a time of change, and we live in a great part of the country in the world where there are four seasons, this being a time of change, maybe it's a time that we need to look at our lives and make changes for the better. If you're a person and you've never personally come to know Jesus Christ, it would be a great time for you to change that, to listen to God and listen to the Holy Spirit speak to you and beckon you to come to know Jesus in a very personal way. And if you're already a Christian, a believer, and a follower, maybe it's time that we looked and say, well, we can do a better job of living for Christ, or we need to move closer to what the Holy Spirit is asking us to be. You know, we look in the Bible, and we have a great lesson today written by Paul from a Roman prison to the church at Philippi. We'll get into that in just a moment, but you know, there was lots of times that Paul suffered many different hardships. He mentions uh, a time of that in today's lesson. But in chapter 3, verses 8 through 21, as our focal verses, we want to hear Paul's heart and what he desires for the church at Philippi. And as it's pinned down for us, we can look at it centuries later, and it's still so pertinent today as it was the day he was he was p having this letter pinned down. Let's get into it. We'll read this scripture. I'll be reading out of uh, New King James Version. But we'll be looking at Philippians chapter 3, starting in the 8th verse and finishing in the 21st verse. Follow along with me if you have your Bibles or your uh, iPad, whichever you have, the scripture. Paul says, Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is from the law but that which is through faith in Christ the righteous which is from God by faith that I may know him 
and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, and whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. As we've read those scriptures, and I hope that you were able to follow along and listen how intently Paul is trying to express himself to the church there, the local believers at Philippi, of which he knew, he knew many because he was uh, the missionary started that little group, and now it's growing and and in most ways it's prospering. There are some false teachings going on among you know coming here and in, in and out, and that is still true today. The devil wants to infiltrate teachings into the truth. Uh, in well, he'd love to do it in all churches, but in many different churches he. The devil is today infiltrating his thoughts by false teachers. Now, we want to look and see exactly what Paul is trying to say to us here. In the first few verses, uh, you could say that Paul is describing righteousness gained. If we look back carefully at verse 8, when he speaks about knowing knowing or the knowledge of Jesus Christ, his Lord. Paul is not talking just about an intellectual knowledge. That's not what he's thinking about or talking about or referring to here. But he's talking about a rather an intimate fellowship that continued to grow. You know, all of us are born as babies. And thank goodness, you know, look, God's grace and mercy, he's given us life to grow to be an adult. Same way in the Christian life, you know, we may be saved at age 9 or 90, but at that moment we're a baby Christian. But we need to grow and want to grow. And Paul is expressing that, is that knowing Christ is just not in his mind, uh, not an intellectual thought, not an intellectual thing that he knows, but it's a lifestyle, an intimate relationship with Almighty God. And he wants to continue to grow. And he wants the church at Philippi to grow. It, you could say that nothing in all of life was as dear to Paul as knowing Jesus. Now think about that. Could we say that? Could, could I say that? Nothing in all of life was as dear to Paul as knowing Jesus. Challenging, isn't it? You know, in verse 9, we look back at that, and it says, be found in him, and to be found in Jesus Christ, but not having my own righteousness, which, which righteousness had Paul been used to running from, running by? You remember, Paul was a great student of the law. 
We could say, and probably would say in our day and time, Paul knew the law from front to back and back to front and knew all the I's to dot and all the T's to cross about the law. But you know what? Paul says, not having my own righteousness, which was from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that he gained through faith in Christ. And he was a gift from God by that expression of faith. You know, Paul looked forward to the day of Christ when he could be found completely in Christ. Paul wanted the true righteousness, not based on his keeping the law or not based on anything that uh, had been drawn up by man to interpret the law. But he knew that the true righteousness was by the faith that he had placed in Jesus Christ. You know, that's no different for us today. We can try all we want to do the right things and to be a righteous person. But if we're doing it within ourselves and apart from our faith in Jesus Christ, then we have no righteousness. The Bible speaks of man's righteousness, mine and yours, human righteousness as dirty, filthy rags, worthless. But the righteousness that you and I can have is through the blood of Jesus Christ and our faith in him and what he did for us and putting our trust in him and letting him be our Lord and Savior. You know, uh, in verse 10, he talks about that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, and being conformed to his death. Maybe that last phrase, being conformed to his death, might be a little puzzling to us, but think about Paul's conversion. On the Damascus Road, Paul experienced the power at his conversion. And all throughout his ministry, as God had led him here and led him there, and God had protected him, and he would, Paul, and Paul is looking forward to that day when he can experience the full power on the day of Christ. What a what a what a powerful thing to motivate you or I, and a motivated Paul to look forward to that day of Christ when he can fully. See Jesus face to face. You see, suffering for Paul was not just a possibility, but a reality on a number of occasions. He talked about a little bit about death. Could he be talking about physical death? He could. He could be thinking about possibly dying, you know, as a martyr. But could he also be speaking about dying to sin and self? You and I, just like Paul, if we are to become more like Christ, we have to die to sin and self, don't we? We have to realize that my plans may not be God's plans, and God's plans are seldom my plans. And I, I regret to say that I have to say daily as Paul, you know, repent daily that I have done some things I shouldn't have done, and that I did not do the things I should have done. You know, we, we, we think about sometimes maybe Paul, the greatest missionary that we have known in old and biblical times. And we think him being perfect. Well, and Paul admits, no, he's not. And he, told, he, he mentions that here in this group of scriptures in his writing to the church at Philippi. Paul knew that the more he, the closer he became like Jesus, the more he realized the areas he had to change in himself. And so Paul mentions that dying in that verse, and he, and I think it's twofold. I think it's dying, possibility of him dying. He realizes he's in prison and he could become a martyr, but he also realizes he's having to die to himself to become more like his Savior. Verse eleven. You know. You just read that one woman over there. He says, if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Well, Paul was certain about his resurrection. Either he might suffer physical death or he might have that resurrection at Jesus' second coming. 
Well, what a great thought is that. <clears throat> we as today believers, we should be looking for Jesus' second coming. What a great day in the life of any believer to be able to be alive <clears throat> and, and, and actually see Jesus come and snatch us up and, and make us a new body, make us that heavenly body. The next few verses, 12, 13, 14, talks about sanctification begun. And you say, well, what, a, what does that mean? Well, let's look at it. Paul says, not that I've already attained, and I'm not already perfect, but what does he say? I press on. I move forward. I, I strive. I strain to move forward in this. He says that I might hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Well, previously in the life of Paul, his name was Saul, wasn't it? And he had considered himself blameless living under the law. Remember his earlier days as, as a youthful man. He considered himself living under the law perfectly and blameless. But now he realizes that that perfection would only come when he saw Jesus face to face. You know, and we think about when he says when, when God had taken hold of Paul's life. Do you remember on the Damascus Road how God took control and took hold? And from that point on, he had a hold on Paul's life. And that was the, the driving factor in Paul's life was God's hold upon him to carry his message, the gospel, to the Gentile world. Re-look at verse 13 with me, please. And he says, brethren, he counts his friends at Philippi, the believers, the church, as dear friends. He says, I don't count myself to be, to have apprehended. In other words, Do you and I as Christians, do, re, do we reach a state of perfection in this life? Certainly not. But one thing Paul did say, he says, don't look back. You know, you and I look back and we have some regrets, but looking back is just costing us time, isn't it? It's costing us concern, and, and it draws the focus away from what we could be doing moving forward. You know, I can't change 10 minutes ago, much less 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, or longer. So Paul says, there's no need for me to look back in my previous life when I was persecuting the Christians, the believers. He realized that that could not be changed. He could not change that. But what he could do was to move forward and press to reach what he knew that God had in store for him. He says... He says, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. In other words, straining for them, just like if you were in a, a race or a contest. He says, I'm working hard. I'm, I'm desiring. I'm desiring those things which are ahead. You know, the things that uh, you and I need to remember are that the moments we have are now. We we don't have the moments in the past. We can remember the moments in the past, some of them. Sometimes we don't want to remember them. Sometimes we can forget many things. But what we have is this moment. We don't have the present, uh, anything but the present. We don't have the future. We hope for the future. We have a hope that is based upon Jesus Christ and his salvation that he brought to us as mankind. But we don't have the promise of tomorrow nor the future. So what we have is now, and, and our time needs to be spent, as Paul is saying, striving for what he knew was God's plan for him. Verse 14, he says, I press, I press, I move forward, move forward toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We could say this about Paul, I believe, that nothing motivated Paul more than the promise of God's call in Christ to know him fully. You know, we find that time after time, and in Paul's writings and watching Paul's life and studying Paul's life, 
nothing motivated him more than trying to be more like his Savior. And that is a tremendous worthy goal for any believer, you and I today, to realize that once we place our trust in Jesus Christ and his death, his sacrificial death on the cross, then he calls us to grow and be like him. Paul, in just a few more verses, will tell you about being imitators. The last, uh, well, the next, uh, what, four or five verses, I guess, 15 through 19, talks about a warning. Let's look at those, what Paul is trying to be. He's, he's advising the church there. Listen to what he said to him. He says, therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, have the same mind, have a unified purpose. And he says also, and if you, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Now, I realize, and you do too, I think, being a Christian does not make any of us perfect. So we are going to have different thoughts about different things. You know, if we were to come together with just 10 people, and all 10 people verbalized the same thought and had the same conclusion, we would be amazed, would we not? Just among 10. So much less the body of Christ. And Paul realized that in, in any church. He realized that there are going to be some uh, different thoughts. But Paul says, if you think otherwise, what? God will reveal even this to you. Maybe this is a lesson for all of us here. Where differences among mature believers existed, Paul was willing to let God work it out. Now, did Paul confront false teachings? Sure he did. Sure he did. But... He wanted to let God work that their mind might come around to be a unified mind of Christ and among that church. Verse 16, he says, But nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Paul is saying here, I believe, keep in step with the truth in Jesus Christ that we know. Paul realized he didn't know everything he wanted to know about Jesus Christ, but he did realize he knew some basic truths, and he taught those to every church and every town and every place he was able to speak. But he's saying, just keep in step with the things and the truths in Christ that you already know. Now, verse 17. Listen carefully what he's saying to his, to his dear brothers and sisters there in Philippi. Join in following my example. Are any of us bold enough to say that to all of our friends and neighbors and our fellow Sunday school class members and our church members? Was Paul being braggadocious? No. No, but listen. Paul says, imitate me. Give careful attention Give careful attention to the examples that are before you. And then I would ask this question to all of us. Who was Paul imitating? And who was Paul giving his full attention to? Jesus Christ. Paul realized he was not perfect. He didn't mean to say that. That was not what he said. But he did say, join and follow my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Paul said, I am trying, and in a sense he said, I'm imitating my Lord Jesus Christ. And you can see my example. Hold me accountable. Pay attention. Look. Now in verse 18, he changes and he talks a little bit about false teaching right here. He didn't tell us all that we might want to know, but he does say this, For many walk, of whom I've told you often, 
And now listen, it says, and now tell you even weeping. So it's a burden it's a, to Paul that some are false teaching among the church at Philippi. And he mentions that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Be careful of false teachers, he says. And look what the, look what the four different things he talks about in verse 19 that's gonna, that is a part of that. What is their end, he says? He says, whose end is destruction. Destruction. And he says, whose God is their belly. Well, you can see I like food, and, and Paul's not talking just about food appetites here. In fact, that's not really what he's thinking about at all. But there's many different appetites that you and I have, and some are not of a godly nature, and this is exactly what was being taught in, uh, by the false teachers. He said they want what they want in an earthly form. They're not looking for anything. And he says, whose glory is in their shame. Well, what does, that, what does that mean? They're taking pride. Paul says, some of these people that are teaching, they're taking pride in their actions that ought to make them ashamed. Ashamed of their actions and feeling like, you know, they shouldn't have done that. He said, they're focusing on earthly things, not on heavenly, holy things. And he's called them to mind to remember those type things that might be uh, among them. The last couple of verses, 20 and 21, uh, probably somewhat familiar with anyone that's been in church very long, but he talks about citizenship. And you know, we could talk about that today. We could say, I'm a citizen of the USA, of which I am. Or you could say, I'm a citizen of the UK or many other different countries. And we could, be, we could have a rightful pride in that. I could be saying, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be an Alabamian, proud to live in Sardis City. But you know what? Paul is saying, our citizenship, you and I that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him, our citizenship is where? is in heaven, in heaven. So I would ask you today, think about where is your citizenship? And the second part of that verse, Paul says, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you and I eagerly wait for Jesus Christ, our Lord, to return? We should live in that expectation every day and throughout the day, should we not? We should be looking forward to Jesus Christ and his second coming. You know, our bodies are going to be transformed into a heavenly body, but wouldn't it be great if you were alive at the rapture instead of having to face death? And, and uh, then you'll be awakened, of course, but resurrected and given a new body. But wouldn't it be great if you just were raptured up as you took your last physical breath to be given that heavenly body. That's how anticipating that you and I ought to be, as Paul was, looking forward, looking forward to seeing his Savior, Jesus, face to face. Verse 21, he says, Who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body? <clears throat> Well, if you and I remember, what is man? What did God take in the very beginning in creation times? What did God take and made man? Dust of the earth, wasn't it? And he breathed life into him. Well, our bodies of dust are going to be transformed into the likeness of the glorious body of Jesus Christ. By God's absolute and all-encompassing power. Not by anything I do, but all by God's work. Paul says, He'll transform our lowly bodies, that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. 
Think about that. God is able. God is able to subdue all things into his will. You know, sometimes we fret and we worry about things that are around us or the complexities of this natural life here on earth. We think about all the things that bother us and concern us and whatever. But don't let us forget that God is absolutely in control. He is sovereign in every way. And just as Paul says here in this 21st verse, he can subdue all things unto himself. You know, if we just thought about that, we would have to go away from reading Paul's letter at this point and saying, amen and amen, brother. Because sometimes when life seems to be complexing and worrisome, we just fail to look and see that God is still in control. He has not lost any uh, ounce of his strength or capabilities and realize that he can control anything and change anything that he desires. You know, we just need to be reminded if we want to look back, we could look back in the Old Testament and see the many miracles that God performed for his chosen children as he led them and guided them and loved them. Then he loves you and I today. And thankful that Paul delivered a message to the Gentile world that ultimately we, I, could become a part of that adopted family of the Lord God. We just want to realize that God is in control in every way, has never failed, and is absolutely righteous. I thank you for being with us and listening. I pray that you'd continue to listen in. If you cannot be here uh, in bodily form, continue to watch. Watch the upcoming message in the worship time, please. Thank you again.